I am scared, but that's okay. If you don't know me, I'm Nico, or Mr. Bad Dog, if you follow my socials. I'm a self-taught artist trying to survive in the comic game or animation industry, or anybody with the coin to pay me to draw stories. The topic of the day is, can a cartoonist do game concept art? Fair warning now, I'm not on par with the current level of in-house artists at your favorite gaming company like Riot or Blizzard. Using what I like to call the scale of hardiness with Tom Hardy, my current level lies in semi-realism to cartooning levels, basically somewhere in the middle. So if you're expecting exhilarating art that will make your toes curl in utter ecstasy, you are in the wrong place. You're going to see a student throw himself at an impossible obstacle. Herculean, in fact, because I registered for the annual game job fair in Finland to network and hopefully find a job. And I procrastinated, which means I only have a week to make new art to post to my art station portfolio. My plight is the driving factor for this video. But don't worry. Don't be scared. It's going to be just fine. If you learn anything from this video, it's this sage-like advice I learned many years ago. If you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. Whatever happens in this art challenge, I got to create within the time limit and post it to my portfolio. And because I'm a masochist, I'm also going to do this challenge without working crunch. Thus, I got to work while maintaining a healthy work-life balance. Again, don't panic. It's fine. I managed to complete the challenge, and you'll see how I did. As you watch the video, stick around to the end to see the outcome of the job fair. So here are the rules of the challenge. 1. Pick a company whose products you enjoy. 2. Pick a job class. 3. Pick three artists. 4. Study one of their works under 30 minutes. And 5. Create a finished artwork in 7 days. Bonus points if you create more than one piece. The measures of success? Complete one work by midnight on the seventh day. I must submit it to my social media, same day, finished or not. And optionally, it must resemble the quality of observed artist. The requirements to complete this challenge, aka the tools, are a drawing tablet, drawing software, photo references, mine or others must be cited, timed with an online stopwatch program, desktop recording software OBS, and of course my colorfully dubbed commentary over my process videos. The description of my tools and artists featured in the video will be in the description below. That out of the way, here we go. Day one, AKA study day. I proceeded to start my day in the late afternoon. For today, I selected two companies with the third being a wild card, Lucasfilms and Techland, i.e. Star Wars and Dying Light. The job classes will be character art and environmental art. Now it's worth mentioning that you should always do a warm up before attempting any challenge. But no time for that because time is a ticking. So the first art study in the challenge had to suffer. So sorry Ian McKegg for butchering your sketches. As you can see in the time lapse of a Jedi Knight, ugh, I, uh, I snafu'd the face. In moments like these you need to remember that you're not recreating a one to one recreation, but rather memorize some aspects of the art before you. Building your muscle memory and imagination is your true goal. I chose Mr. McCaig because he is considered the GOAT in the industry, so why not study the man who created Darth Maul? Despite only using pencils, his knowledge of anatomy is apparent when creating fictional characters, so I made sure to memorize as much as possible. Fun fact, I also play movies in the background while I work. Nothing wrong with that, but if you want to access your full potential, no distractions. In this case, the Goonies are worth the flack. I managed to get through half a short circuit before the challenge mandated break time. Some food in a dump later, we returned back to the two remaining artists, Nick Shindranu and Doug Chang. I'm notorious for avoiding environmental art because I'm not quite good at it. But we don't shy away from the hard things here. Again, sorry for butchering your art, guys. It's here where I started picking up my stride with this concept art for The Mandalorian. Admittedly, it's one of my favorites. I wish I could have had more time for each piece, but the rule was 30 minutes per study.
you'd be surprised how much time goes by, and conversely, you'd be surprised what you can get done in 30 minutes. With Mando complete, I move on to the concept for Season 2. This I tried to do in color, but it wasn't working out. I'm inexperienced to painting traditionally, and it reflects in my digital painting skills, so here I change tactics. First, delete your art. Second, I switch from movies to watching funny video game challenges on YouTube. Thirdly, paint according to your current level. In my case, it's painting in black and white because it's easier to note the values. The results speak for themselves. The day ends at 10.30 p.m. Time spent today drawing is the equivalent of three hours of YouTube videos, the entire runtime of the Goonies, and half of Paul Blart Mall Cop. Day 2. More studying, aka dying light day. The same procedure applies here. The job classes are the same as yesterday, but the artists are different. Here's the lineup of concept artists in order of appearance. Learning from the sins of yesteryear, I decided to do a warm up through my side project. It was a slow start today, but when I got to work, I got to work. I struggled with Kephas's work, specifically the perspective on the interrogation chair. Eventually, I stop before the 30-minute mark to conserve energy and avoid fatigue before completing the remaining two studies. It's here that I got pissed off with the pre-programmed shortcuts interrupting my workflow. Whenever you hit a hot key like Brush in Clip Studio, it will also share the same key with tools like Airbrush and Patterns brushes. So to avenge myself, I went into the shortcuts menu and deleted it from the B hotkey. Will that decision later bite me in the ass? Who knows? No time to think about consequences now. Finish this one with some time to spare. I managed to get through two environments before having to go on my usual errands. I also discovered on my drive back that I mismanaged the day, having missed the warm-up session for the game job fair. Not a good day to say the least. So to redeem myself, I went out of my way, working well into the night to finish. I picked Raful's early concept for the evil renegades. I like the way he handled the preliminary drawings using basic shapes and mute colors to form the characters. So I tried my best to encode this approach to my current tool set. Probably helps that the art style itself drew me in. It really reminded me of Samurai Jack for some reason. That bit of nostalgia helped me power through and finish two characters for the price of one. Thus, completing Techland. Though, the night is still young, so I decided to move on to the third company presented here. The Wild Card. And that company is freelancers because I couldn't think of one company that I could find publicly available concept art without eating away at my day. So I chose three artists under the environmental job class. They go as such. Jason Courtney, a.k.a. Dead Space, Sid Mead, a.k.a. The Goat 2.0, and Gray Rogers, a.k.a. The Wolf Among Us. So let's get going. Jason's work was a treat to study in terms of designing futuristic technology. Finished it in 30 minutes. Now on to the mead. Showing up to the dojo ready to learn from another master. I struggled, of course, because I did the art equivalent of trying to draw a Rembrandt in crayon. Doing a master study of legends will always have its challenges, especially getting his exact composition and finer details. So to meet this challenge, I decided to use a legendary technique passed down since the days of antiquity. It's known simply as zoom out and squint to get the composition right. A lot of details were left out. Is it nice looking? Who cares? Next contestant. In this piece, I just wanted to copy the general composition and mood. Because it had a cartoony style to it, I could feasibly recreate what I was seeing. This time, I was a lot happier with the result. Therefore, I was redeemed. In short, day two ends, I create an attendee card for the event and head to bed, thus concluding the study portion of this program. What follows is day three, the real project. I'll be recreating my own little game jam here. What that means is that I create a fake game and I make art for it. Don't question it. I'll be borrowing Riot's philosophy towards games using DNA. It stands for Design, narrative, art. Starting with design, the game will be a top-down RPG, not too dissimilar to indie horror game Faith the Unholy Trinity. 
Simple in design, but dispersed with animated cutscenes to get under your skin during gameplay. It will mostly be a puzzle game with three levels to explore and backtrack. It will also be trying to hide from an omnipresent opponent while seeking a treasure. Once you get the treasure, you need to escape. This takes care of design. What follows next is narrative. Or in other words, what's the story here? If you haven't guessed it yet, I've decided to make this into a horror game. At a glance, the game itself is based on a mashup of Chucky and The Collector, with the premise as follows. A man is murdered in his home. He possesses his son's discarded toy in their basement, thanks to a special family heirloom. You must avoid the killer and his death traps, all the while looking for your son, through the clues he left around the house, and you have to find him before the killer finds him. Though a simple enough story on the fly, this will guide the art direction. My mission at this stage is to create not one, but three art pieces. Character art, environmental art, and promotional art to sell the concept. I took a stab at character art before the night was up. I decided to make three characters, the father, the killer, and the son. To start, I drew a basic mannequin with animator lines to get the right proportions. Ignore the mannequin head, I don't end up using it. Better to be overly prepared, kids. Sketching the dad was a bit tedious because he'd be informing the design of the rest of the ensemble, so here I decided to get the obvious stereotypes out of the way. Utilizing shapes like squares, triangles, and circles to denote the character's possible temperaments, and to supplement this process, being a storyteller at heart, I decided to ask myself a question. What does a father look like? And then, list some adjectives that come to mind to describe a potential dad fleshing it out with complete sentences as the sketch progresses. What I came up with goes like this. The nerdy, stay-at-home dad. The boxer, or tough guy with a heart of gold. This is where the Anka necklace first appeared. It will play a role in the father's resurrection later in the story. Then there's the scholar. A privileged professor, he's book smart but socially clueless. Decided to give him dad shoes for utility and lacking in fashion sense. And finally, the everyman. This was my last idea, so I wanted to create a character I don't see a lot in horror movies or games. A minority character who doesn't fit the paragraph of a horror hero. He is someone I would have worked with while landscaping, working at a fulfillment center, or underneath a car. Barely scraping by, but he's hopeful things will get better. I also decided that this character would be an urban genius in addition to being a single father. What stopped him from reaching his full potential is anyone's guess. All that matters is what he does with it now. And for the story, and by extension you, you need to solve the death traps and clues found throughout the game's levels with your hidden genius. Ultimately, this last design was my final choice even though I didn't know it yet. At the time I decided to move on to the killer because I was more decisive on how the killer should look. Here I asked myself, what terrifies me? And because I've been watching horror since I was in the crib, I decided on a Nile mask. The choice was inspired by the mask worn by the villain in the opening sequence of No Time to Die. There's just something about an expressionless face that looks joyous that sends shivers down my spine, especially if I see its disembodied face lurking in the shadows of my home. Or maybe I'm just reminiscing of fighting those enemies in the Wii game Red Steel. I decided to deck him out in a black military sweater and cargo pants, tucked into his boots with duct tape wrists over leather gloves. From my personal experience, if you're going to do rigorous exercise in hazardous environments, military gear is a must. It will also signify the killer's potential background. But bear in mind, the more you know about a monster, the less scary it is. So no further information will be revealed beyond the killer's second outfit and new moniker, the mother. I figured that the killer sees himself as a hero. Their goal is to punish bad fathers, saving abused children, quote unquote. To lure the victims to him, he puts women's clothing over his usual attire, plus or minus a wig. The last design I decided to give him a fat suit with a broken mask, possibly causing the final fight. Through the ideation process, I decided to also give him a second mask, an Oni mask, feeding onto the idea that there's one mask to lure while this mask is worn to punish. The exploration is wrapped up with the inclusion of a minimalist briefcase, meant to carry his tools and costume once the job is done. I was running out of creative energy at this point, so I thought it was time to move on to the boy's design. I started by drawing a child mannequin to get the proportions right. 
Now I didn't choose the dad design at this point, so to solve this problem, I decided to make a different son to each dad design. So the nerdy dad got a nerdy son, the boxer got a dirty scrappy kid, the scholar a hippie, and the blue collar everyman got a poor scholar. It became apparent with all these iterations that I liked the last version. He seemed to fit the spirit of the son. Intelligent and gentle but weak, making him easy prey for bullies. Probably not wearing the latest fashion, suggesting he's from humble means. Because of these two factors, this may have drawn the attention of the villain of the game. Time was running out, so after four hours of work, I made my decision and copy-pasted a crude character sheet together. After some minor fixes, it occurred to me that I forgot one last key player. The toy. So running on fumes, I drew whatever came to mind. A lion, rabbit, elephant, and bear. For the sake of time, I chose the simplest to draw, but least seen in games. A bunny and an elephant. In pro fashion, I decided to draw a mannequin to give the toy some bones. Once the base design was created for each, I duplicated, added, and subtracted pieces from each iteration. Like a sock to replace a missing foot or stuffing coming out of the ear. The focus was to signify that this was a forgotten toy that was abused, but mended by someone who cared. Someone who may not be in the picture anymore. Leading to the idea that the toy was a source of pain and thus abandoned in a box in the basement. Another question I asked myself with little energy left is, which of these designs do I see least often? I liked the bunny, but the elephant had this ghostly look to it and decided that the little guy was the clear winner. So after lassoing him and pasting him to the character sheet, I gave him and his original body the necklace of Anka otherwise known as the Egyptian symbol of life and death. The aforementioned magic heirloom the playable character would have been given before the start of the game. And with that, ends day three with no further incidents. I wasn't happy with the first pass, but that's why they invented later on. Because it's a problem for later on. Day four, environmental art. It's Thursday, and I feel the pressure of the clock ticking. I switched gears and set out to draw the setting of the game. Due to severe allergies, I became bedridden. I couldn't afford to lose time, so to mitigate my symptoms, I filled up a sink with water, dunked my head, and held my breath for as long as I could. Repeated three times, trying not to drown myself. I carried on the rest of the day with a mask on so as not to get gunk on my stuff. Suffice it to say, this unorthodox approach did only so much. If you ever find yourself in this kind of situation, know that Time and rest is your only friend. So I laid in bed watching Guilty Pleasure anime and listening to 311 for several hours till I felt good enough to keep my eyes open. The exterior was hard to nail down, so I moved on to the daunting task of the interior. Remembering the design decision I made earlier, it eased my anxiety. All I need to do is draw from a bird's eye view, leaving only the bare minimum. I treated this like looking at an architectural blueprint. We start at the basement, then moving up two levels to the main floor consisting of the kitchen, blocked off patio to backyard, and the living room. And then the top floor composed of bedrooms, closet, bathroom, and secret crawl space where your son is hiding. I could have went further with this, but I decided to shelve the idea and ultimately settled with these sketches as my interior for the game. I went to bed that night eager to finish. What remains is the second pass for the character sheets and exterior of the house. Day 5. Revision. The key here was turning off your brain. Everyone has their special way to shut off and reach flow state. Monks use meditation and rigorous exercise to reach this higher plane of existence. I used Ace Ventura. And as you can see, I excelled in this segment. I was really proud of how the father came out on this stage. The more I drew, the more I fleshed out this kind of underdog. Didn't hurt to inject my own experience into him, including the dangerous way I read books and my own relationship with my father. It all came to a head when I came to the name, which revealed itself without much effort along with the rest of the story. Bo, the single father who works two jobs to keep the lights on. They purchased a rundown fixer-upper on a deserted road in the remote country to give his son a better life. 
The downside is he's not there to spend quality time as much as he wishes to be. The best he can do is walk his son to school and play puzzle games in the evening before his next gig. The inciting incident was a father's decision to break this trend and come home early to celebrate his kid's birthday. After calling in a favor for someone to take his shift and scrounging enough money for a cake and a new puzzle, he went home to surprise his son. But the moment he sets the cake down in the kitchen, he hears a strange noise coming from the basement. The answer of what he found is start the son's design. I dubbed him Jake because he kind of looks like a Jake. Nothing more I can say beyond this point in terms of art. I tried to make Jake fit with the narrative of a bright young man who was kind like his father, but easy prey for ridicule either because of his stature or how he sucks at sports. One day the schoolyard bully breaks his glasses and when he tried to fight back he was humiliated in front of the rest of the class. None of the teachers saw, of course, all except one adult standing near the schoolyard, thus marking Jake as the antagonist's next rescue victim. On the bus ride home, the killer follows. Somehow Jake spots the killer observing him from the kitchen window. The phone line is cut, and there's no neighbors in sight. Jake decides to hide, leaving clues for his father throughout the house as the killer breaks in. The killer's search is interrupted when Jake's dad arrives early from work. I ended this exploration midway with how Jake looked before and after the events of the game, stopping at the mannequin. In summary, I finished one and three quarters of a character sheet with Ace Ventura 1 and Ace Ventura 2 to thank for this progress. Day 6. The clock is really ticking. I finished drawing Jake before and after, deciding that he'd live at the end of the ordeal. Whether his dad survives is up to the player and the main villain of the game competing for the treasure that is Jake. The mother. The sketches speak for themselves, scarred, strong, and driven in his mission. I decided to bulk the killer up to contrast with Bo and Jake's slender physiques. By copying and pasting these designs, I found my new lineup sheet. I made the decision to make today a wrap-up day and focus on the exterior of the house. I badly wanted to set the scene of this battle of survival. A different approach is always a good idea when facing a difficult task. Using my memory from Scott Robertson's book, How to Draw and Drawing Sketching Objects and Environments from Your Imagination, that's a mouthful, I decided to use two-point perspective to convey the house with dash marks to mark the basement level. The first and second floor can be inferred from previous sketches. I also didn't feel like drawing it, so there's that. I decided to open up past ideas from my first pass as reference windows on the left side of my screen while I worked taking pieces from each and making a new monster. Here's the qualities I decided to lift from my life and also add to the reasons why the mother went after Bo. There's a hole in the roof, an unstable crumbling porch, overgrown yard with rusting debris out front from previous owners like a derelict car, a single line connecting electricity from the house to electric pole and phone line a crowded basement full of box junk, and most importantly, surrounded by woodland on a single back road where no one can hear you scream. The cherry on top was including metal bars over the windows and the patio being boarded up, originally to keep people out. Now it's meant to keep you, the player, in. All these attributes make it perfect for a serial killer to infiltrate and morph a home into a maze while hunting for his new son. By the time help finally arrives, he'll be long gone. I was very happy with the end result. Whether pros like it or not, I can't say. Time is still a ticking, and there's no point for me to nitpick with this newborn. Nearing the finish line, I made a checklist. Character art? Check. Environment art? Check and check. What's left? The answer? Promo art. By definition, art that can go on ad banners or box art. Its goal is to communicate an inkling of what to expect of what you're buying on Steam. This is what remains. And with one day left, I was sweating. Bear in mind, I already sunk in five hours and was feeling cranky. Add four hours and 26 minutes on line art, and I wanted this nightmare to end. But the torture wasn't over. An art challenge is only a challenge if you do something you suck at and hope for the best. And ladies and gents, I suck at coloring. 
and like putting glass in your favorite ice cream, I decided to complicate things by trying a new coloring flats technique with a custom brush I saw on YouTube. Because it looked shiny. The trick is to block out the figures in separate flat grays with the vector brush on the same layer. The idea is that it makes coloring simpler and avoids gaps when you decide to zoom in or blow up the image for billboards. As you can see, I suffered for this decision because I still ended up getting white spots and didn't understand how to make this process go faster. So when in doubt, fall back on what you know. So I made a masking layer and I just colored everything from there. I also forgot what my keyboard shortcuts were and futzed around like a clown till I returned to my flow state. I ended day six with flats and crawled to bed, leaving the choice of values for day seven. Day seven, a game of shadows. Neat trick I fall back on a lot is duplicating the adjustment layers and then merge them together and keep modifying from there, saving the original copy in case I'm unhappy with the new attempt. The lighting situation was still a mystery to me, so I made several studies to decide where the light would be coming from for the killer. I needed to communicate imposing. After the grueling process, I made a choice and stuck with it, suggesting the light source is coming from a broken lamp or an ajar door. Eventually, I changed the color of the light background with red to emphasize danger. This differs from Jake and his father who I chose gray and blue to communicate vulnerability and innocence. The composition is a bit on the nose, a neutral party caught between danger and salvation. If I learn anything in indie comics and the animation, it's good to be obvious. After more duplications and merging and the last minute choice to flip the canvas, I decided the name of the indie game. Hide and Seek Jake. With the title complete, three hours of makeup, and less than 30 seconds to midnight, I was done. The challenge was complete. It's not perfect, but that's the beauty of a game jam art challenge. You only have so much time to create something out of thin air. Whatever you create, you must be proud of it and post it, perfect or not. And post it, I did. So here it is. Results time, baby. After all is said and done, how'd we do? Did we complete the challenge? Yes. We added three new pieces to the old folio. On time? Yes. Was quality on par to industry standards? Uh, no. But in my defense, concept art isn't supposed to be pretty. That job is reserved for splash artists and illustrators. As a conceptor, TM, you create throwaway ideas that pave the way to the next best idea. Pretty is an art challenge for another day. Presently, I'm just content with my little indie game art. Now for the outcome of the game job fair. I slept through it. Oh well, we'll get them next time. Stay persistent and catch you later.